We're about to walk through everything you need to know about building a marketplace app on Bubble as quickly and correctly as possible. But before we dive in, let's start with an example of an MVP one of our entrepreneurs has built. Zebrahood is a unique take on the marketplace format. This is a Bubble app that offers a collection of walking tours that you can follow stop by stop through Australian neighborhoods. The tours themselves are suggested and created by locals and anyone can come on, search for an area they're interested in and access fantastic guides for each tour. The tours are designed on pages with easy to share links and contain rich descriptions of the location, level of difficulty, a start to finish itinerary, plus an integration with a custom map that makes following the walking tour as easy as possible. If you create an account, you can also favorite tours to save for later. While all you need is a browser to access this Bubble app, Zebrahood has also been made available in both app stores for even more convenience. Okay, let's dig into the first step you'll wanna take when building your marketplace app on Bubble, which is to organize your database. Your database is one of the key drivers behind making your app user-powered and interactive. Remember that every app is different, but you'll typically find the following tables of data in a marketplace app. The first is a table for listings, or in bubble terms, a custom data type that you create with the name listing. Your listing record is what makes up the marketplace itself, so this is a critical one. Listing records usually have fields for a title, description, price, a status of some kind to know whether it should be visible in the marketplace, for example. So this could be you know, active versus inactive, draft versus published, or maybe listed versus sold. If images are involved, you could have a simple image field here or relate the listing to a separate data type that's specifically for images. That way you can have more properties tied to the image itself, such as captions and identifying it as the featured image. Take a moment to really think through all of the properties you'll need to describe your listing and set up fields for them. The next data type you may need is a buyer and or seller profile. Now, there's a few ways to go about this. You could set up profile details directly in the built-in user data type that you'll find in every Bubble app, or if you want a bit more separation, you can create separate profile types and relate them to the user that owns them. Again, how you organize that will depend on the complexity of the profiles and a bit of your own personal preference as well. Profiles can have biographies, profile pictures, listed skills, and more. The point of having a profile in a marketplace is to help users understand who's behind the listing or potential transaction. For example, guests who are looking to book a vacation rental may want to learn more about the property's host, or customers looking to hire professionals may want to learn more about the pro's background and experience. Profiles can also be linked to reviews. Reviews are actually another common data type that you'll find in a marketplace environment. A review can be as simple as a single numerical rating from one to five with a comment, or more complex where reviewers are rating across multiple areas of interest and maybe even uploading photos. This is the kind of data type that you can really manipulate uh, for your designs as well. So for example, you can use star icons to display the value of those ratings and scores. You can aggregate multiple scores across you know, many reviews to create an average and then display that on the profile. Or you can affect your search results, right? You can filter based on ratings or even sort uh, profile results based on those ratings. Now, what about organizing payment information? Yes, the next data type you'll want to organize is one for transactions. The transaction type should detail everything you need to document the flow of funds, subtotals, tax, discounts, deposits, paid amounts, pending amounts, and of course, relationships to the listing, the buyer, and the seller. If you're working with transactions, then there's a good chance you have an integration with a payment gateway. Those gateways will store the sensitive information like credit card numbers or connected bank accounts for you, but make sure to include fields for IDs coming from that connection, such as an invoice ID, a charge ID, refund ID, and anything else you'll want to document. A field for the status of the transaction is very helpful to keep track of progress and even trigger next steps in the overall flow between your users whether that's to help confirm a booking or uh, create a shipping label or pay out funds to the seller. Next, many marketplaces will include messaging features where buyers and sellers can communicate with one another. For this, we recommend using two data types, one for a conversation thread that acts as a parent to multiple child messages and one for the message itself, which has a one-to-one -one relationship to that parent thread. 
This structure allows for an inbox type of setup where users can have multiple conversations with separate people, but not get them mixed up. Imagine your normal email or text thread, which is made up of back and forth replies between recipients. This is the same type of structure. You can also link the conversation thread to a listing if it helps to have that reference in your design. And remember that we're just talking about the structure of the data here and how you're gonna organize it all. This type of structure supports many different types of messaging logic and designs. So for example, you can prevent users from messaging each other until a payment is made. You can make it so that one side has to initiate the conversation first before the other side. Um, you can add file attachments, right? If you add a field to the message type for a, a file, you can save a file to that uh, message and then that way it can show up in the middle of the thread. Uh, you can also make it so that automatic messages are created whenever actions are taken. There's a lot you can do here. The important thing is that you're structuring your types to capture the information you need. That way you can design uh, the front end however you'd like from there. Now, I mentioned adding status fields to some of the data types, and I wanted to take a moment to point out Bubble's option set feature. Option sets are a great way to organize different preset lists of choices. For example, your transaction status could be one of the following, unpaid, paid, or refunded. Or let's say that your app was a hiring marketplace and you had a separate data type for job applications. The application status options could include draft, submitted, interviewing, hired, rejected, and withdrawn. This can really help you keep track of uh, data and their flow throughout the user's engagement with one another. Option sets can also be used to organize categories of things. So for example, you can identify your users by role, buyer, seller, admin. You can also identify transactions by type, so authorization, charge, deposit, refund, uh, transfer. And the key here is to set up the sets that you know you'll need, um, understanding that option sets cannot be changed by the, your users themselves. This is something that you provide as the application and then link them to the appropriate types within the fields. All right, now that you've organized your app's core data structure, it's time to think about your most important user flows. You know, marketplaces have many moving parts, so it's really important to get a clear picture of all of the A to B pathways that your users may experience while also keeping things easy to navigate for them. Let's start with seller onboarding because without sellers, you'll have no listings, therefore no marketplace. And here are some things to consider when setting up new sellers. What exact steps does a seller need to take to get signed up to your app? Think about any requirements they need to meet and verifications they need to submit. The level of detail here will depend on the nature of your app. Start with a simple signup form first to create that user account. From here, you can layer in additional requirements before they're allowed to, let's say, create a listing or move on to viewing their dashboard or performing a search. For example, you may want to take advantage of Bubble's built-in email confirmation feature or require them to enter in a phone number or a photo. And make sure you're actually enforcing these requirements as well. So for example, if an unverified seller tries to create a listing or access a restricted area of the app, you can use custom logic to show them a message that lets them know what steps they need to take to move forward. And this also just goes back to the custom data that you're collecting in your database to create that kind of custom logic. If you're processing transactions, you're going to have an integration with a payment gateway like Stripe. Stripe, for example, requires sellers to provide more personal information like address and bank accounts, identity documents. Do you want them to go through any seller registration steps at this point, or do you want to allow them to complete that later? These questions may be answered differently depending on the type of marketplace you build. Users, both buyers and sellers alike, may have different tolerance levels for how much information they're required to provide just to get started. So you're gonna to wanna to balance your user retention with quality signups. The next major user flow that can easily branch off into a variety of conditional subflows is your listing engagement. This is truly the heart of the marketplace. So generally your buyers will start by searching the marketplace and marketplace search can happen many ways. It can be more like a browsing experience where users navigate through predetermined categories. It can require users to select filters first before they see any results. Or it can be more of a matching system where you know, maybe you collected some preferences from your buyers during their onboarding, and then you can present them with tailored results using your own logic instead. 
or it can be a combination of any of the above. This is a decision that you'll have to make uh, for your own app specifically. Now, once the search does produce some results, what is the user looking at now? Is this a table of results? Are they looking at a map? Can they swipe through the list? Can the user bookmark a result and come back to it later? So figure out how you want to display those results. You can also think about paging your results if there's potential for hundreds, if not more items that can affect performance. Um, also how much information you want to show per listing just within the results window and so on. Then once the user sees a result they like, they'll click on it and be taken to a separate detail page. You can display this detail in like a pop-up or you can stay within the same page if you want, but usually we're seeing marketplaces navigate users to a completely isolated page, kind of like a profile page just for that listing uh, because it's a little bit more SEO friendly if you wanna be able to share uh, a direct link to that listings detail page. In Bubble, this is a dynamic page where you'll pass the selected listing record to it through a workflow. Behind the scenes, this page is designed more like a template to be populated with dynamic data. So in other words, you don't need to create separate pages for every individual listing since you can't possibly anticipate what those listings are gonna be and it just wouldn't be very scalable. So one single dynamic page is all you need for this. Aside from getting all the information uh, they need about that listing here, you know, descriptions, images, and so on, this is typically where they'll take the next step to commit to it. Again, depending on the nature of your marketplace, this is the big purchase button or book, request, send offer, whatever it might be for you. And once the user does make a commitment of some kind to that listing, do you have any requirements that you need to check through first before they can actually move forward? You know, as you can see, there are many micro decisions that need to be made here uh, to really polish off all of these flows, but just take it one step at a time. I really recommend you start with creating a baseline to address, you know, the most common normal flow that most of your users should experience. And then you can layer in any error handling uh, and edge case scenarios on top of that. Okay, so you've onboarded your users, you've connected them through the marketplace, now you have to seal the deal. Typically, finalizing the marketplace connection will involve a variety of transactions and confirmations to be sent to everyone involved, not to mention a few updates to your database. That way you can create new documentation around the transaction, track statuses, or even remove the listing from the marketplace altogether. My biggest advice here is to document whatever you need to keep your users informed. Once a transaction is processed, for example, show a confirmation message, send a confirmation email to both parties and display a record of that transaction in their dashboards. This is especially true if money is involved. No one wants to lose track of their funds, whether it's leaving the buyer or on its way to the seller. If your users feel like they're in the dark, you as the app admin are gonna hear about it. If anything, this is the area you want to stress test the most because commitments have now been made. Real quick, we're covering a lot of info here about building marketplace apps, but if you're actually ready to build your own custom app, we have tons of students doing so using our Fast Track course, which was designed to cut months off your development time while also understanding how to build an app correctly on Bubble so that it scales over the long run. If you wanna see if this is gonna be a good fit for you too, head over to coachingnocodeapps.com slash fast hyphen track. Let's take a look at another more traditional marketplace app built on Bubble. Change Republic is a freelancer marketplace specifically for learning and development professionals. When you sign up as someone hiring for a role, you can post a job or a gig by filling out all of your requirements in an easy to follow form. The platform will then take care of matching experts with your posted jobs or gigs. On the flip side of this, if you're an expert in the L&D space, you can set up your profile so that the platform can find the most relevant work for you. This is a marketplace where the app is doing the connecting for you with its own proprietary matching logic behind the scenes. And this is all done using bubble logic. The app also offers additional services alongside its flagship marketplace to help users get further connected in this community. Okay, so up to this point, you've organized your data structure and you've figured out your most important user flows. Now you have these blueprints that you can follow to implement your custom logic and designs. And trust me, it's worth spending the time to get clear on everything we've talked about to this point, 
outside of your editor before you dive into building. You know, there's a lot of decisions that you're going to have to make in every aspect of the application and the better prepared you are going into it, the more efficiently you'll be able to move through your work. You know, this isn't to say that you're not going to continue running into other decisions as you go, but if you can come in with some plans already figured out, you'll be able to move much more quickly, right? The last thing you want is to go through back and forth uh, decisions leading to wasted time and wasted effort. So now it's time to build out your pages in your bubble editor. And in most marketplaces, you're typically going to find the following buyer and seller dashboards. These are your users home bases. This is where sellers can manage their listings and both can view their histories of orders or bookings, whatever it might be within the marketplace, along with transaction histories. This is also usually where they can manage their profiles, their account settings, and even access a notification center. It really is the home base for all of your users. Depending on how different your buyer and seller experiences are, you may decide to split this into two distinct pages uh, for these dashboards or decide to use the same page with some conditional logic to show and hide certain areas based on who the user is. This is also a page where we usually see tabbed designs to make it convenient for the user to quickly move between sections without having to experience full page reloads. In Bubble, you would be taking advantage of custom states and or URL parameters to create that effect. Search results page. This is a page that can look very different depending on the type of marketplace you're building. You'll want to present your search results in a way that's going to be most useful for your users. For example, Airbnb offers a prominent map option so that you can see what part of town your rental is in. Compared to Etsy, which doesn't need a map because the marketplace is defined physical and sometimes digital products that will be delivered to the buyer. Instead, there's a much bigger emphasis on categorizing listings to make it easier for buyers to navigate the vast you know, selection and find what they're looking for. Listing pages. Now, there are at least two pages you'll want to create here to manage listings. The first is the page your sellers will go to to create and edit a listing. This is one giant form, essentially, with inputs to collect information about that listing. And the second page is the public-facing detail page that buyers will see when they navigate there from search. This is where all of those listing properties you organized in your listing data type will be referenced, right? The images, the descriptions, things like that. So make sure that you account for them when you're designing your various inputs and other visual elements. Depending on the level of detail for a listing, you may also want to design these pages into tabbed groups to keep things easy to navigate, especially if there's a lot of information. Order summaries and confirmations. We usually like to see these as standalone pages, although you can get away with simple pop-ups if there's not a lot of info to show. Overall, these screens are here to recap information for your users, so the important thing is that they're presented at the right time and are very clear. These can also be used um, as a reference you know, with confirmation numbers or uh, statuses to keep track of you know, the transaction process if necessary. Inbox. An inbox can honestly be an entire app on its own, so consider the level of complexity you need for your marketplace's messaging features. The main thing to keep in mind here is that your design should make it clear to the user which conversation they're looking at and who they're speaking with. Start by creating the individual pages you know you're going to need in your app no matter what, and then work on the general layouts of those pages so that all of your features have a place to live. You may find that as you continue working, you will adjust some of those decisions. That's very normal. But as with everything in development, you know, try not to tackle too much at once. Everything is going to have a ripple effect. So take the time you need to lay down a reliable foundation first. This may mean simplifying your designs if necessary to make things easier to test at the start. Aside from all of the above, you may also need some ancillary pages like extra confirmation screens, separate sign up and login pages, a place for FAQs and things like that. Now I've been talking about keeping things simple, creating baselines for yourself first, especially as you're getting started, but eventually you're going to be past those basics and you'll need to start addressing edge cases and error handling. We can't forget about these abnormal scenarios because they will come up and you want your app to be able to respond accordingly. Starting with refunds, while we wish for every transaction to lead to 100% satisfaction, you should plan on handling requests for refunds. This should involve implementing refund policies that keep you in control around timing and guarantees. And if you do agree to process refunds, your payment gateway is going to show up again here. Make sure you're clear with your users about what your policies are and that your refund logic is well tested. 
Next, booking conflicts and rescheduling. Similar to refunds, if booking dates and times are involved in your marketplace, you can expect for plans to change and users to request a reschedule. Decide on what kind of policies you want to enforce around this, and make sure you have plenty of documentation around these changes in your database as well. The more transparent the paper trail, the easier it will be to resolve any conflicts and enforce those policies. Next, delayed or failed deliveries. If your marketplace involves the shipping and delivery of physical products, make sure you have a way of not just tracking the delivery status, but also notifying users if a problem occurs. We recommend integrating with a package tracking service like Shippo or EasyPost. Bubble actually has a few plugins for both of these services, and you can also use your own custom connection with Bubble's API connector tool if you need. Speaking of integrations, your Marketplace app may have connections to other third-party platforms, um, which you'll need to manage errors for as well, right, per platform. So this could involve other custom API calls or webhooks. Webhooks are app-to-app -app notifications, and you would be working with your editor's backend workflows if so. And uh, you know, if you have them, the biggest ones to look out for are those payment integrations, um, identity verification systems, uh, and package tracking services. Design-wise, don't forget about your empty state designs. This is true for any app, actually, and is generally most relevant for users who are new to your application, right? They've just signed up. A new user isn't going to have any data that they've created yet. Sellers won't have listings. Buyers won't have any transactions yet, and so on. So what are they gonna see when they navigate to their dashboards for the first time? The last thing you want them to look at is a blank screen. That's gonna make them think like the app is broken. Take a moment to add in what are called empty state designs. These are conditional designs that only display when there is no data to show otherwise. The designs can be as simple as a text that says something like, you have no listings yet. Uh, but we recommend helping your users here as much as possible, so instead of, you have no listings yet, you can say, you have no listings yet, but click here to get started with your first one. And that can include a button that takes them to the listing creation page, right? That simple little design makes a big difference in your user's overall experience. All right, I hope that was helpful. And if it was, the content you're about to see on the next screen will help you take things even further.